Lesson 1.2, Analysis of Functions, A Graphical Approach. One of the foundations that everything within this course uh, is going to rest on is the idea of what a function is and how a function works. Over the next two lessons, we're going to talk about how to analyze functions. First in this lesson, using a graphical approach, and then in the next lesson, using an algebraic approach. Now, a lot of what we are going to talk about in this lesson and the next lesson is reviewing what you learned in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, so I'm not necessarily going to be going into a deep dive on how uh, each of the processes work. Uh, mostly, I'm just going to go through a run-through, a quick run-through, a review of what you've previously seen, and uh, see how certain aspects of uh, function analysis connect to other aspects of function analysis, where they may have been disjointed in previous courses, here we'll see how they're all basically connected. Now keep in mind in this lesson with the graphical approach, a lot of what we're going to be doing is based on observation. I'm going to give you a picture of a generically drawn graph, and you're going to tell me something about that graph. Whereas in the next lesson, we're going to do this algebraically, and when it comes to an algebraic approach to function analysis, you have to know something about the family of functions that we're looking at, where with graphical functions, every graph is basically the same graph. We don't need to know about different classifications per se, mainly about certain features that come up frequently. So let's begin at the beginning with a function. What is a function? Well, a function is a type of relationship. Uh, between any two or more variables, you can have some sort of relationship that exists between those variables. Now, a function is a type of relationship, or a type of relation which can be described using a verbal rule, an algebraic equation, or a graph, which is what we're going to focus on in this lesson, where each input value is paired with a single output value. Another way to think about a function is a cause and effect relationship. And when I plug something in, I get something out. I cause something to happen, and there's an effect based on that cause. I hit someone with a hammer, and the effect is an immense amount of pain. I plug something in, I get something out. Now here what we have is called function notation. y equals f of x. Again, that is pronounced y equals f of x. Math is very similar to an English class where we need to learn how to properly pronounce the notation. We don't refer to sentences and spelling. They're more equations and notations, but they still need to be pronounced properly. y equals f of x. So the name of the function is f. f is acting on x, and f of x is producing y. So because f is acting on x, we call it the independent variable. x is your input. You can pick anything you want for x, which makes it independent of all other values whereas y is the dependent variable. Your output value y depends on your input value x. So again, we phrase this y is a function of x, or you could also say y is dependent on x. So identifying the fact that y is the dependent variable, whereas x is the independent variable. Whatever the independent variable is, that's your input, and then y is your output. Now let's use this understanding of function notation to help us evaluate and solve functions based on a graph. So here is a generic graph that I have drawn. Hopefully you recognize this graph as a standard parabola. You spent a lot of time last year talking about parabolas. We're going to spend a lot of time this year talking about parabolas. Parabolas are kind of your first step to high level thinking when it comes to algebraic equations. Algebra 1, uh, you mainly focus on linear equations and lines. Algebra 2, we got to go into the bigger world, the bigger spectrum of ideas. The quadratic parabola is our first step into that arena. But here, we don't really need to know all of that stuff. We just have a generic graph. Every graph is the same as every other graph. You're not looking at the classification. You're not looking at the type of function here. We're just looking at certain features and certain common features that apply to all graphs. Now here again, the question is to evaluate f of negative 1. We spent some time in the algebraic basics unit reminding ourselves the difference between the word evaluate and solve. Evaluate is when you plug something in. Solve is when you pull something out. When you're evaluating, you know the x value and you're looking for the y value. When you're solving, you know the y value and you're looking for the x value. So for this question right here, we want to evaluate f of negative 1. So based on my understanding of function notation, 
I know that this value right here represents my x value, x equals negative 1. And I'm looking for the y value when x is negative 1. So let's put a little question mark right there since I don't know what it is. Now, another way to think about this notation is I, if I know the x value and I'm looking for the y value, I'm looking for the point on the graph whose x value is negative 1, but y value is unknown. So I'm looking for a coordinate whose x value is negative 1, but the y value is unknown. So if I look at the graph, well, here is x equals negative 1 on the x-axis. So that means this is the point on the graph whose x value is negative 1. The y value then would have to be negative 3. Thus, the coordinate on the graph whose x value is negative 1 is the coordinate negative 1, negative 3. So f of negative 1 is negative 3. The y value that corresponds to x equals negative 1 is negative 3. Now we can turn that thought process around and say determine the value of x such that f of x equals 3. So this time it's the x value that's unknown, question mark. And the y value is 3. So I'm looking for the point on the graph whose y value is 3. Now before I've started with the x-axis and marked off x equals negative 1, this time I'll start on the y-axis and mark off y equals 3, 1, 2, 3. And hopefully you should recognize actually there are two points on this graph whose y value is 3, and that's perfectly fine. We can have multiple values that answer a given question. We've seen that before. So when the y value is 3, I can see an x value right here. Now notice it's not an easily read value. That's perfectly fine. Anytime we're dealing with graphs, we need to be prepared for the uh, need to approximate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate this value to be about negative 4.6. Anytime we're approximating, that's a 4 right there. Anytime we're approximating, there's no need to be overly precise. I'm going to go ahead, just go one uh, digit past the decimal point to show that it's not an exact value, but it's also uh, not uh, incredibly precise. So I'm going to go negative 4.6 on that one. And how about this one? Let's just do 0 0.6. So then determine the value of x such that f of x equals 3. Well, I have two answers, and because they're approximations, I'm going to use my little approximate sign instead of an equal sign, and I'm going to list out my answers, negative 4.6, comma, 0 0.6. So my two approximate answers that satisfy the given condition. All right, now that I've done a couple of those uh, for you, now I'm going to give you an opportunity to try it on your own. Here is a completely different graph. It doesn't matter what the graph looks like. Just focus on the question and evaluate the question based on what it says. Now, the only thing that may be new to you on this particular graph is this piece right here. Now, keep in mind, you've uh, seen this before in uh, previous math classes when dealing with inequalities. Remember that a closed dot represents an existing point versus an open dot represents a non-existing point. So on this graph, at x equals 0, the y value is not 1 because the point does not exist at that endpoint. So the uh, this particular curve right here is closed, which means it's included on one end, but it is open or excluded on the other end. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So go ahead and try these three questions and pause here. Hit play when you're ready. All right, so looking at the first one, f of 4. So I'm asking when x is 4, what's the y value? So let's look at the graph. 1, 2, 3, 4. Here's x equals 4. The y value exists down here at, that would be negative 3. Second question, f of negative 3. 1, 2, 3 is the x value, negative 3 anyway. So we're going to go up here to this point right here. Looking at the y value, that would be positive 3. And then here we have f of negative 1. Now notice right here at x equals negative 1, I look for a y value up, I look for a y value down, and I see that the graph actually doesn't exist anywhere along the vertical line at x equals negative 1. That's perfectly fine. If I ask you what f of negative 1 is on this graph, that graph doesn't exist. So what I'm going to say is undefined. UND is a common abbreviation for undefined. This function is not defined at x equals negative 1. So... It's not a trick question. There's no such thing as a trick question, just questions that you don't know how to respond to. When you have a function value that doesn't exist, simply respond with undefined. Speaking of which, if I had asked f of 0 on this problem, so at x equals 0, we have that open dot. Now remember, the open dot represents an 
in, uh, an excluded value. It is not included. It is open. So f of 0 would have also been undefined, whereas f of 4 was at negative 3 because that was a closed dot. Closed is included. Open is excluded. So that point does not exist on the graph, whereas this point does exist on the graph. So again, that was practicing evaluating, but we also need to practice solving. So let's go ahead and look at the next slide. Pause here, hit play when you're ready. All right, so again, zero, negative two, and five, these now represent y values, and we're looking for the corresponding x values. Starting with the first one, when y is zero, now remember this is my y axis, positive y values go up, negative y values go down, so that means zero is right here on the x-axis itself. So when y equals zero, the x value has two solutions, one right here and one right here. I'm gonna list them from left to right. So this solution would be at negative four, so I'll say x equals negative four, and this solution right here is at positive one. So x equals negative four and positive one. Let's go ahead and switch our color. So f of x equals negative 2. So negative 2 is right here on the y-axis. Once again, there are two solutions, one here and one here. This time we're going to approximate. So I'll use my approximate symbol. So that one's going to be, let's say, negative 4.5. And this one, how about 3? How about 3.3? Anytime we're approximating, keep in mind if this is a test or a quiz, and clearly we're approximating, as long as you're close, then I'm going to accept that answer. If you had said 3.2 or 3.25 even, I'm going to accept that. That's perfectly fine. If you were to say 3.8, uh, I may be a little bit more hesitant on accepting that answer, but anything close to 3.3 plus or minus a decimal is going to be accepted. All right, and one more, f of x equals 5. So let's look at 5 on the y-axis. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if I look way up here, notice to the left, notice to the right, the graph doesn't reach that high on the y-axis to y equals 5. So in this case, there are no points on the graph whose y-value is 5. So because the question is solving, I'm not going to say undefined. We say undefined when we're evaluating and there's no answer. When we're solving and there's no answer, we say no solution. Now, anytime we want to say no solution, instead of writing out the phrase no solution, you're also welcome to use this symbol right here. It's not a zero. It's called the empty set. The empty set is saying that the set of all solutions is empty. There are no solutions to this problem. So you can either say no solution or you can say empty set. Undefined would not be an acceptable response here. Just like on the previous problem, to say no solution would not be an acceptable response because I wasn't asking you to solve. Saying no solution when I'm asking you to evaluate doesn't make any sense. That's a thing, like saying, what's your favorite color? And you say uh, a strawberry. Like strawberry is a fruit, that's not a color. Make sure that you are responding to the question that's being asked. All right, now that we've talked about evaluating solving with functions, let's talk a little bit more about how to identify a function. We already talked about the definition of a function being any relationship where every input is paired with a single output, but let's talk about that a little bit more in depth. Consider, think of a function like a machine. You put raw materials into a machine and it spits out a finished product. Input, machine, output. Input, function, output. So if I put in an x value, let's say x equals 1, I plug it into some function and it spits out y equals 5. Okay, that's a well operating machine. It's doing what it's supposed to do. It's taking the input x equals 1, performing some action on it, and producing an output y equals 5. Numbers could be anything. I'm just making stuff up randomly. So now, alternatively, consider if I have input x equals 1 and input x equals 7. Plug it into a function and it produces the same output y equals 5. That's perfectly fine. We saw that a moment ago where we had here, right here, x equals negative 4, x equals positive 1. Both of these inputs had the same output. That's perfectly fine. It happens all the time. You can have a function that has multiple inputs that produce the same output. Again, to uh, uh, come up with a, a related example, a machine that produces shoes. I could plug in um, fabric 
or I could plug in plastic. Both inputs produce the same output, a shoe. What's not allowed in order to satisfy the condition of what a function is, each input value is paired with a single output value. Let's say I plug in x equals 1, and the output is both y equals 5 and y equals 7. This is not a function. A function can only have one output paired with a given input. If I have a single input that has multiple outputs, we do not call this a function. We can still call it a relationship. There is some sort of relation occurring between the input and the output, but the special qualification known as function does not apply in this situation. Consider if you plug in materials to make a shoe, and you plug it into the machine and it spits out a shoe and an umbrella. Well, this uh, uh, machine is not functioning properly because it's spitting out multiple objects uh, at the same time that are not the same thing. So you can have multiple inputs that produce the same output, but you cannot have a single input that produces multiple outputs. Now let's talk about what that means in terms of looking at a graph. Now we should be able to just look at a graph and determine whether that graph represents a function using this definition that every input is paired with a single output. Now when we're working graphically, we use a little technique called the vertical line test. Hopefully you remember the vertical line test from Algebra 2. If not, here's your quick little review. Keep in mind that a vertical line essentially represents an x value. So anywhere I draw a vertical line on the graph, I'm crossing the x-axis at a particular x value. So this vertical line right here represents the x value located at that point on the x-axis. Now if I draw this vertical line right here, notice at this x value I have two y values. I have a y value up here and I have a y value down here. So what I'm saying with this vertical line is that the vertical line representing the input has multiple outputs. So because a function can only have one output for a given input, I can say that this graph does not represent a function. The shorthand then for the vertical line test is to say, if I can draw a vertical line anywhere on a graph and that vertical line crosses the graph in more than one location, then that graph fails the vertical line test. And if it fails the vertical line test, it is not a function, not a function. I'll just write func for short. So it is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. VLT is a common abbreviation for vertical line test because the vertical line test is such a well-known rule, a well-known test. Uh, it's perfectly fine to abbreviate it and have a random reader with a basic knowledge of algebra understand what you're saying. So it's not a function because it fails the vertical line test. So take a look at this graph real quick. I'll give you a 10 second head start to think about it. Does this represent a function? So if I take that vertical line, Let's go ahead and grab that vertical line. Notice if I draw this vertical line anywhere on the graph, notice we're crossing once right here, we're crossing once right here, we're crossing once right here. Anywhere I draw this vertical line, that vertical line only ever touches the graph in one point at a time. Therefore, this one passes the vertical line test. And because it passes the vertical line test, I can say that this is a function because it passes the vertical line test. That's a V right there, not a U. If it passes the vertical line test, it is a function. All right, here are two more examples for you to try on your own. Pause here, play when you're ready. Looking at question C, notice if I pass that vertical line, hopefully you immediately recognize that this just automatically fails the vertical line test and I'm gonna be lazy, I'm just gonna copy and paste. One more try. So this one is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. Finally, looking at question D, looks like, looks good, looks good, looks good. Now the only issue you might be concerned with is right here, let's call it x equals negative one. But notice, we saw this a moment ago, this point up here is open versus this point down here is closed. If it's open, that point does not exist on the graph. So if I try to draw that vertical line right here, notice that at x equals negative one, the output value is right here, 
this is not an output value. So I don't have to con be concerned with this point being a, a second output value paired with this particular input value. There is only one output value at x equals negative 1. It's where the close dot is. So since that area is of no concern to me, if I look at the rest of the graph, I don't see anywhere else where the vertical line would cross the graph multiple points at a time. So once again, we have a function because it passes the vertical line test. Now that we've looked at a few examples together of the vertical line test, I'm going to give you an opportunity to try this over and over and over again on your own. Now, throughout this lesson, uh, we're going to be looking at different aspects of graph analysis. We are currently looking at whether a graph represents a function, but we're also going to look at domain, we're going to look at range, we're going to look at intervals of increasing, decreasing, maximums, minimums, etc., etc. And what we're going to do is these 10 graphs right here, I'm just going to go through these 10 graphs over and over and over again for each set of examples. So we're going to go through these 10 graphs right now and determine which ones are functions and which ones are not. And then in the next section, we're going to look at these 10 graphs again, identify the domain, identify the range, identify intervals of increasing, intervals in decreasing, and so on and so forth. So be prepared. We're going to look at these 10 graphs over and over again. So let's look at the first one. Now again, uh, this is the same graph that we looked at earlier, so getting in that theme of we're just going to look at the same graphs over and over again. No reason to come up with a brand new graph every single time. Uh, but we just went through four examples of determining whether something is a function and how you know. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you to try this one on your own. Hit pause here. Play when you're ready. All right. So this one should be fairly straightforward. If I imagine a vertical line passing across this graph, I don't see any points where the vertical line would touch the graph in more than one location at a time. So this one uh, passes the vertical line test. Therefore, it is a function. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Pause here. Play when you're ready. All right, this one, again, uh, just apply the vertical line test. Uh, I'm not going to actually draw a vertical line this time and going forward. Feel free to you know use your pencil uh, against the screen if you need to, to act as a vertical line anytime you're unsure. But eventually, you should be able to just eyeball it just by looking at it and saying, yep, this definitely passes the vertical line test. And I'm going to be lazy. And I am just going to copy that and paste it right here so that I don't have to keep rewriting, yes, passes vertical line test. Because, uh, spoiler alert, a lot of these are going to be functions. Not all of them, but a lot of them will be. Looking at the next one, pause here, play when you're ready. Hopefully you got the same answer I did. Yes, this is a, ver uh, a function because it passes the vertical line test. Looking at this one. Now, this one may uh, uh, give you a little bit of hesitancy because there's something new and different. Again, every graph is the same. It's just certain features of graphs that we need to be familiar with how to uh, work with. For instance, uh, right here when we had the open dot versus the closed dot, we saw that that's of no concern because an open dot is just... Uh, a place where the graph doesn't exist. So an overlapping open and closed really only has one output value. Well, here's something new, uh, or at least new in this course because we haven't seen it yet this year. You did see it uh, in previous years. When we have that dotted line right there that the graph or the curve is approaching but not crossing, we call that an asymptote. A-S-Y-M-P-T-O-T-E. We have a vertical asymptote right here, and then we have a horizontal asymptote right here. Again, an asymptote is not part of the graph. It is a line that the curve approaches. So as the curve gets closer and closer to the asymptote, it levels off to where the asymptote is going. Same thing as we go vertically, as we get closer and closer, it's leveling off as we get closer and closer to that asymptote. Now, we want to be especially careful when applying the vertical line test in a situation where there is a vertical asymptote. Now, it may appear like the curve is getting uh, is becoming vertical. Well, it's not becoming vertical, but it is getting closer and closer to vertical. Now, to help us out, I've gone ahead and uh, drawn this uh, particular curve using a the Desmos graphing calculator. Notice it's the same function that I have right here. Vertical asymptote is at x equals 1 vertical asymptote is at x equals 1. So as the curve gets closer and closer, we can apply the vertical line test. Notice that I can pass the 
vertical line across the graph. But as we get closer and closer to that asymptote, it appears that the curve is getting more and more vertical. But the question is, does it ever actually become vertical? Now notice, as I identify points on the curve, as I get closer and closer to that vertical asymptote, the x values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller as the y values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So in order to be vertical, that would mean two coordinates right next to each other would have to be directly above and below each other. They would have the same x value. Yet, as I can see, the x values, x values are getting closer and closer and closer. They're constantly changing. And as I go up and up and up, we're getting closer and closer and closer. Now it appears that the uh, curve has gotten right on top of the uh, asymptote at a certain point. But even if it appears that way, if I zoom in, I can see there's still plenty of distance between the asymptote and the curve. And as I go up and up and up, the curve is just gonna get closer and closer and closer. Now it's gonna slow way down uh, the rate at which it gets closer and closer and closer, because keep in mind, we've got infinity amount of space to work with, but Hopefully you can see the curve is still getting closer. It is not uh, uh, actually vertical at this point because it is still getting closer to that vertical line. At no point will this curve ever actually be vertical. So since the curve, as it approaches a vertical asymptote, the curve never actually becomes vertical. That means the curve still passes the vertical line test even when there's a vertical asymptote. So. Even though I see a vertical asymptote, that is of no concern to me as far as whether it passes or fails the vertical line test, which means this one, just like the others, passes the vertical line test is a function. So going forward, when I see a vertical asymptote, a vertical asymptote is not a reason for failing the vertical line test. All right, here is another one. Pause here, play when you're ready. Here, the only place that you may have concern is right here, but we saw this previously. This is open, this is closed. So at x equals two, there's only one output value at x, I'm sorry, at y equals negative one. So this one, once again, passes the vertical line test. It is a function. Pause here, play when you're ready. Here we have a nice smooth curve. I like to refer to these as well-behaved functions because there's nothing weird about them. This one is a definite yes, passes the vertical line test. Here we have a not so well behaved function, but still easy enough. Pause here, play when you're ready. Here we almost wanna say yes, passes the vertical line test, but then we look a little closer. This time at x equals negative one, I've done something different. Instead of one being open and one being closed, this time we have two points that are being closed. So at x equals negative one, we have both a y value at zero and a y value at negative two. That says negative two and that says equals zero. Because that given x value has two y values, the input has multiple outputs. For the first time, we're gonna say, no, this is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. All right, here's question H. Pause here, play when you're ready. Here we have probably one of the more complicated examples that we're gonna to see today. Uh, notice I have a vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptote causes me no concern. That does not present a reason to fail the vertical line test. We have an open point. We have a closed point. We have an open point, but none of them overlap. So we have a yes passes the vertical line test. Pause here, play when you're ready. Once again, a nice smooth curve passes the vertical line test. Pause here, play when you're ready. Here we have, once again, a smooth curve. It's got a breaking point, but it's still a smooth curve. Passes the vertical line test. So with that, that wraps up our uh, discussion of determining whether a graph represents a function using the vertical line test. Next step in this process, we'll be determining the domain and range of those same 10 graphs. So we can move on to that as soon as you're ready.